come to our keynote speaker, Mr. Greg Solomon, CEO of McDonald's South Africa. We have a broad representation of stakeholders joining us directly via Zoom, and they will post their questions directly onto the chat box. At the end of the keynote, there will be a Q&A, and we will respond to as many of your questions as possible. To get a direct invite to the next talk tomorrow, the 21st of May, 2020, by Mr. Tokozani Nkosi, co-CEO and co-founder of Newsroom Africa, please send your details to the WhatsApp number 082-088-5262. Or you can also visit our EmpowerWorks website where you can also get information about Empower Men, Empower Women, Empower Youth, Speakers Firm, Leadership Summits, as well as the events that EmpowerWorks hosts. We are live on the following EmpowerWorks digital platforms, YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, and the hashtag that we've been following for this conversation, conversations is Empower Entrepreneurs. COVID-19 has changed the world. I'm just wondering, Mr. Solomon, what are some of your insights and priorities as the CEO of one of the most popular global brands during lockdown, and what does the future look like for customer experience? Over to you, Mr. Greg Solomon, CEO of McDonald's South Africa. Well, thank you very much, Sachaba. Uh, to the Empower Works uh, team, thank you for the incredible thing that, you, uh, that you've put together. Um, conversations are the most important things at the moment. To the ladies and gentlemen that have joined me, um, I bring you greetings from McDonald's. I bring you your favorite Big Mac, your French fries, your strawberry shake. Uh, but uh, let's, uh, let's talk a little bit uh, about uh, the reality as well. I think sometimes before you look through the windscreen, you've got to look in the rear view mirror. And uh, you've got to uh, ask yourself uh, where you've come from. If you don't know where you come from, you pretty much can't plan, you know, pretty much where you're going to. So I know that uh, Sichaba wants me to talk for a while, maybe 15 minutes, maybe 20 minutes. I'll try not go longer than that. But I, um, I'm going to give you a heads up straight away. I really want to take your questions. Um, so uh, I think that's where we can interact a, a little more. So... I, I truly believe um, it's, it's, it's an obvious thing that we had a crossroads in our lives. I tell my people and the customers that uh, our lives will never, ever, ever be the same, ever. And I think we need to understand that. Um, if we think things are going to return to any form of normality, um, then we, um, we're pretty much uh, sort of out of kilt with, uh, with what's going to happen in reality. But any crossroads, you have choices, ladies and gentlemen. You go left, you go right, you stand still, you stay at home. Uh, what, what do you do when you have choices? Now, I want to I let you know first that you are free of the choices that you make, but you're never free of the consequences of those choices. And that's very, very important because we as, as business leaders of this country, men, women, mothers and fathers, nephews, nieces and children, we've got choices to make at this point in time. Do we choose left? Do we choose right? And those choices are perhaps easy. Those choices are perhaps difficult. Those choices will come back. Good choices will come back to bless you, and bad choices will haunt you for a very long time. So I'll leave you with that reality check around choices and how important uh, our thoughts are when it comes down to, to what we have to do. So let's look in the rear view mirror of McDonald's. On the 11th of November, 2020, this year, in a few months' time, we'll celebrate our 25-year anniversary and how powerful or inspiration or just from a reflective standpoint are we going to spend our 25-year anniversary um, in lockdown, in some form of restriction. Uh, McDonald's made a very conscious decision, uh, if you know, 25 years ago was also when we came out of uh, pretty much pretty close to when we came out of apartheid. And I knew that McDonald's wouldn't make an investment in this country as long as we were locked out and, and locked down with apartheid. So we, 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 have a, we have a real deep reflection, both as a nation as, as, and as a country, to, to make. But needless to say, let's reflect a little bit on the past. I've been with McDonald's for 23 years or 24 years, so I've pretty much lived the entire journey. And uh, from that perspective, I can tell you the story that it took 
around uh, 18 years to maybe 17 years to open up the first 100 restaurants. And then it took the next 12 years to open up the next 200 restaurants. The moral of the story is as you pace yourself in any growth and any entrepreneur, I ask you around the first lesson that I want to share with you, and that's balance. The balance between your persistence and your patience, the balance between your people loyalty and your bottom line profitability, the balance between your customer and the balance between your employee. As leaders, as entrepreneurs, we have to balance these forces, the balance between your home and your work. So uh, 25 years ago, we, uh, we came to McDonald's uh, in Blackheath, uh, Gauteng, and we brought drive through I'm seeing a few faces on the screen. I would imagine many years ago, uh, a lot of you uh, were probably still uh, kids at school. So you probably didn't uh, know too much about McDonald's and drive through And then I see one or two faces like, uh, like me that uh, we've been around for a while, so you probably would, uh, would know. And we brought drive through to the country. And in a humble way, not in an arrogant way, I guess uh, that was brand new to a constitute a South African consumer, coming through and getting food in a drive through And now drive through is uh, completely part of our lives. So, um, you know, it's amazing that uh, you can find drive through pharmacies now. You can drive other, you can find other drive through fast foods, and soon you'll find drive through banks um, and a, a variety of different convenience uh, forks. And then about uh, 13, 14 years ago, we, uh, we decided, should we go 24-7 in McDonald's? At that time, I was chief operating officer of the business. And uh, one of our franchisees from Bruma McDonald's, the late Ishmael Maloko, and one of our franchisees from, uh, from Springs, Mr. Peter Moyanga, they said to me, we had just come back from America, and they said to me, Greg, should we, uh, what about 24-7? And I said, guys, 24-7? In this time in South Africa, I mean, it's, it's got to be crazy. I mean, it's, it's the most violent place. I mean, we can't go 24-7 uh, in this country. And plus the fact, guys, who's, a, who's hanging around at 2 o'clock on a Saturday night? I mean, uh, it's crazy. There's no one, surely there's no one joining around. But surely I was showing my age at that time already. And uh, plenty of people joining around and hanging around um, um, at 2 o'clock on a Saturday. And I guess the rest is history. Our 24-7 business is 4.5% of our total sales. A year later, we decided to open breakfast in McDonald's. Now, sometimes you have to copy and you can, uh, you can we would have thought, if I had to ask this audience today uh, for what we don't know about McDonald's, let's invent and let's design a McDonald's breakfast. I'm sure we would probably come with some sort of porridge or maybe would come with uh, two pieces of toast uh, two boiled eggs, some beans, or we might have come with two fried eggs and some bacon and some toast. Uh, but we didn't do that. We came out with a, uh, with an item called an egg McMuffin. It's two almost like scones with a poached egg with a piece of turkey in it because we are 100% halal in McDonald's, so we can't have bacon. So we put a piece of turkey on there and we called it the egg McMuffin. And so... Maybe my next message to you is sometimes you need to be a quick follower, but also sometimes you need to be a maverick. Now, the thing with being a maverick is um, there's some heroes that are mavericks. You know, if you, uh, if you have a look at uh, some of the leaders that have invented uh, certain things in our, in, our, in our lives. But for every maverick, there's, uh, for every one maverick, there's 99 men and women that have failed to be a maverick. So we need to understand, you know, that uh, in, you know, to constantly invent and constantly uh, bring innovation to our business is not, it's like winning a jackpot. But the real reason why we brought in an egg McMuffin is that if we are so strong on drive through, you're not going to eat two fried eggs and a rasher of bacon in your car. You needed to eat something in your hand. And so, hence the egg McMuffin. It's now 12% of our total business. So, as I sort of calculate that, you've got breakfast at 5%. You've got, sorry, breakfast at 12%. You've got 24-7 at 5%. And, and so you grow your business through different channels. Same customer, different channel. Same customer, different opportunity. So seven years ago, we decided to say, Shh, what about coffee? What is the future of people eating? Is the Big Mac, French fries, and Coca-Cola going to be a staple diet forever? And uh, I guess uh, we... Uh, was the birth of a brand called McCafe. 
Nekefe last year in 2019 was voted the coolest coffee brand in Joburg. Um, and uh, we are the second largest coffee brand already in the whole of South Africa. So now you've got a footprint of 250-odd restaurants. We're now 300. Then it was about 230-odd restaurants. And how easy it is to scale a different brand on the equity of a really strong assets. And so we put in these McCafe offerings, 100% espresso-based coffee, some lovely muffins, some donuts, some uh, low-GI toasted chicken paninis, and different cheese-type sandwiches as we start to change the perception and change the way people eat um, fast food. Because a trend is not fast food. The trend is actually good food served fast. And so if you know, all right, that that's where your business needs to be, all right, and you know that you are the biggest food consumer anyway, let me turn my phone off, I don't know why it's ringing, maybe that's a child that's sending me a text. Um, you need to understand where you want to be. It's like a milli, it's like a milli, uh, a milli corn. Sometimes you have to plant the seed today or any bamboo tree or all these stories that we hear about something and you only have to harvest it in a year's time. So you need to think about your business. You need to say to yours, what does your business look like in the past? What does it look like today? And where do you think your business needs to be in 10 years time? And we'll talk a little bit about COVID. COVID has made that a huge reality. McCafe is now 6% of our total business. 6% McCafe, 5% 24-7, 12.5% breakfast. So all of a sudden, hold on a sec, is McDonald's a hamburger business now? Or is McDonald's a real estate company? Is McDonald's a coffee company? And so 18 months ago, we didn't know about COVID. We didn't have a tap-up. We decided we're going we're gonna to launch our own delivery service. Now, at that point in time, we knew that, uh, that Uber and Mr. Delivery hadn't even announced themselves yet. So we launched a, a delivery service called Mac Delivery. And uh, Mac Delivery was our own delivery service. Um, and very, very quickly between Mac Delivery, we signed up Uber and Mr. Delivery who contributes a further north of 10% of our business. Delivery, 10%. Breakfast, 13%. 24-7, 6%. Mac Cafe, 6%. You could do the maths. We basically added 25 to 30% to our top line without even selling a big net. So we need to understand when you build a, a strong foundation and a strong business, um, you can start to leverage that with other services. Now, where we've got to be careful is uh, what we've seen in COVID and what we've seen with all PPE. I'm not quite sure if any of you are PPE officials right now. You know, we were hamburger guys, but now we're PPE guys. Uh, we were seamstress that were making beautiful dresses, but now we're PPE guys. Uh, we were advertising and promotions guys. But you know what, guys? Now we are PPE guys. And so uh, really what's happened in the business is that I've seen a lot of companies, and I even got caught with it. Came February when I saw that COVID was going to hit. I had some PPE guys come, Greg, you've got to buy masks. You've got to get it done. So I bought these, sur these not surgical masks at 14 rand a mask. They're now selling for 5 rand 50 a mask. So what's happened is we've seen a lot of businesses try to leverage PPE, but now all of a sudden the market's completely fallen out. And they're sitting with stock at 14 Rand, trying to set it in a competitive market at 5 Rand. And all of a sudden, you made a million Rand profit, but now you're sitting with a million or two million Rands of the stock, and you don't know what to do. So what I'm saying is diversify your business, but stay in your lane. If you're a marketeer, stay in your lane. If you're in construction, stay in your lane. If you are in production, stay in your lane. You can look at slightly, look left, look right. But don't look too far away from the value proposition that you can add. Let me give you an example. If you are um, a pharmacist, um, you could pretty much open your own pharmacy. And, uh, and, and from, that, from that pharmaceutical store, you could probably open uh, from 8 in the morning till 5 in the afternoon. And you could probably serve 100 customers. And so you could probably make, let's say, 10,000 rand a day. And that's as much as you can do as a pharmacist. You study as long as you have to, five years to be a pharmacist. But if you're a pharmacist and you're an engineer as well, and you're an accountant, and, and you're a farmer, and, and you think you're everything, well, then really, where is your focus? But if you only had two focuses, if you were a pharmacist and maybe you were a public speaker, a pharmacist and a public speaker only, you see how powerful it is? It multiplies each other by 10. Now, all of a sudden, in the day, you can be in a pharmacist. 
in the night you can be a public speaker all right or a teacher doing something else and so you can magnify yourself extremely powerfully if there's such a word there's no real word it's powerfully but extremely uh, thoughtfully if you want to do it if you focus on one or two things and you really really do them well so from that perspective uh, that's where the business is at this point in time we employ 16000 people in mcdonalds we have 300 restaurants what a lot of you don't know is uh, north of 50% of our restaurants are actually company run restaurants no. Most of our people are between the age of 20 and 30, so really, really young people. Our youngest restaurant manager, Gift, uh, is 27 years old. 27-year-old guy running a 54 million rand business, all right, and has uh, 62 people reporting directly to him. So next lesson for you, you've got the university, and then you've got the university of life. It's two different things. We should never stop learning. I tell my kids often that are both at university right now, I say to them, university is not the end. The university is just the start. It's just teaching you what your life is going to be like for the next 20 years. So we should constantly build and we should constantly develop uh, ourselves as leaders. I want to talk to you a little bit about um, leadership because I don't think we have a leader problem in this country. I really don't. I think we have a leadership problem in this country. Now, you and I are leaders. We have three forms of leaders. Leaders that have to lead themselves. Leaders that have to lead departments. And leaders that have to lead organizations. Now, as an entrepreneur, you may have a small, a small business. You might just be by yourself. And you have to find all three leadership styles uh, in the way you do things. But the question that I ask you when it comes to leadership is what is the most powerful form of leadership? I know many people uh, quote Madiba. Madiba is everybody's hero, so I can't claim him to be my hero. But obviously, with a lot of reading, uh, I think uh, Nelson Mandela was the most influential leader that I've ever come across in my lengthy career. Now, the word influential leadership is quite an important thing. Let me, let me talk to you about my formula. For, the, for those that may not know me, I'm, I'm a hamburger guy now. They call me the hamburger dude, but uh, I, uh, I'm an engineer by profession, a civil engineer. So I'll use some mathematics and some formulas. So I want you to pick somebody in your life. You don't have to tell anyone. Just put that person in your mind, your brother, your sister, your boss, uh, somebody who works for you, somebody who's close. And I want you to rate that person out of 10 on how much you trust them. 10, you trust them 10 out of 10. Zero, you trust them absolutely. You have absolutely no time for this individual. All right? So I'm going to choose the person. Trust, I'm going to go with eight out of ten. All right? The person that I'm thinking of. Now I want you to rate that person on how much you respect them out of ten. Trust, you've rated them. Now respect. I'm going to go with eight out of ten as well. You got your numbers? Okay. I want you to multiply those numbers together. 8 by 8 is 64. 10 by 8 is 80. 2 by 2 is 4. The moral of the story is that that person didn't score more than 75%. And that person's not influential in your life. Now, the moral of the story is not what you would rate people. The moral of the story is what would people rate you. Now, you build influence by trust and respect, like I've just showed you. You build trust by delivering on your problem, on your, on your promise, and you build respect by teaching somebody something new today. So if you can deliver on your promise as a leader and you can teach somebody something new, especially in this country of South Africa, you can be an inspirational leader. Next few things I want to talk a little bit about is your plan. Like a chess master, you need to understand what your plan is. And this is building into my COVID thought now. You know, if you've got a one-year plan, I think COVID hit you quite hard. If you're thinking quite far out, I'm thinking five years, six years, eight years, I'm trying to get to what does our business look like in 10 years' time? 
as hard as COVID has hit us, and it's hit us really hard in McDonald's. There's no, absolutely no doubt. We knew where we wanted to be in seven years' time. We knew where the business wanted to be. We had started our digital transformation already. We understood what our, employee, our, our, our employees need to look like. We understood our talent. We had built a Hamburger University for our people because we knew that we had to skill them in things that colleges and universities can't get to be beyond. So COVID's hit us hard. There's no doubt about it. But all COVID's done is it's accelerated a trend. What was going to happen in the next 10 years is now just going to happen in the next two years. For those companies that had fought, for those individuals that had fought, where they were going to be in 10 years' time, I think your recovery in your business is going to be a V-shape, much quicker, six to 12 months recovery. For those that were caught, maybe with their hands over the eyes, not knowing where they want to be with a long-term vision, I'm afraid to say, ladies and gentlemen, your recovery is going to be that much longer, north of 24 months. So from that perspective, we always need to take a learning and an understanding uh, from where we are in the business. In McDonald's, we have a concept called a three-legged stool. When the stool is standing with three legs, it stands. When one leg is down, the stool falls down. The three legs resemble our franchisees, our suppliers, and our corporation. Living in harmony together, one of the powerful things for us that's got us through the COVID time. Now, the question is, if one leg falls down, chair falls down. But I speak to my franchisees often. The three legs stool culture of McDonald's is not necessarily about making everybody happy. It's about making everybody equally happy. A very, very small point around compromise, around consultation, around debate, about positive discomfort. These are very, very important points for us to build. And then the last one that I want to share with you is on leadership. And then I'll tell you a little story and then, then close off with some COVID thoughts is around uh, innovation. If you are, run an organization, I'm lucky enough and privileged enough to run this organization of 16,000 people. If your innovation triangle looks like this, where you're only making decisions from the top, my head and my mind is about uh, equal to everybody else in my organization. If I'm trying to come up with innovative ideas, um, I'm going to probably come up with one great idea every single month. But if we can turn our innovation triangle around where innovation is happening at the grassroots level and you genuinely listen to your people and you have an innovation forum where when they speak up, you announce all the innovation ideas and you choose your top innovation ideas, you'll get to 10 ideas per month and you'll scale your business that much. I have a concept called the power of 10. Every time something in your life, in your world, in your business changes by tenfold, you have to completely innovate. You have to completely change who you are as a leader, as a businessman, and as a businesswoman. When you scale your business from one person to 10 people, you cannot do things the same. Your systems, your thought process, your strategy, your leadership, your accounting systems have to completely change. When you move from 1,000 Rand profit to 10,000 Rand profit, 100,000 Rand profit to a million Rand profit, every time your life scales, your business scales by 10 times, if you're still doing the same thing the same way, you will be quickly obsolete as an organization. When the external environment is moving faster than the internal environment, you'll be no longer uh, as a business. So let me share with you a few philosophies around COVID and what it means maybe for McDonald's. I'll be a bit philo philosophical for the next two minutes, and I'll see I've got about 10 minutes left, and then I'll close. First, I think what's going to what's going to really, really happen, this is just Greg's opinions. Don't quote uh, well, you. I guess you, have, you can quote me. These are my opinions, but I'm, I don't have any facts. Let me put it that way. There's no doubt that we're going to have this this uh, balance between the East world and the West world, between China and America, between Russia and Europe. And uh, when we get those two balances in, in our lives, what does that mean for us as South Africans? We are at the tip of South Africa. We are isolated from everybody else, but we are heavily dependent on China uh, in the relationships that we have, and we heavily dependent on the Rand dollar. But if we get this, let's call it a cold war. Let's hopefully it's nothing more than a cold war because COVID-19 is pretty much a hot war right now. But there's no doubt that we've got this dynamic 
between the east and the west. Uh, the next thing that I'm predicting as well is that you'll have a more circular economy, which means that what leaves our economy and our earth needs to return to our earth, effectively a greener world. We as the human nation, the human being, the human species has taken a lot from our world, and I think our world is giving it back to us now, very much so. And so I think green is the future, and I think people will pay more for green and try to save money and not be green. I think anything green is, 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 is the future and our thinking. If we really want to be sustainable, we're going to use packaging material that can ultimately go back into the ground, that can become compost, that can make more potatoes. Anything that we do with our beef needs to be consumed in such a way that it adds more to the atmosphere than takes away from the atmosphere. I think the human species, the human race has understood that this is more important than the bottom line profit. Talking about bottom line profit, the balance sheet and the liquidity in our businesses will become more important than ever before. We know we hear about this word cash is king. I'm saying to you now, liquidity and balance sheet is the most important thing. We need to equip our businesses that, is, that if this ever happens again, can we close our businesses and pay our people for the next six to 12 months? I think people are going to think very, very differently. So how do you build your balance sheet? Or you guys just got heaps and heaps of debt. And with heaps and heaps of debt, you're going to be working for the bank instead of the bank working for you. The next prediction that I'll make is similar to the East and the West. And I want to talk about something called local is lacquer. I think we owe it to our people. The South African people are some of the most talented people I've come across. I'm lucky enough that I experience talent around the world. And uh, our franchisees win worldwide awards. Our restaurant managers win worldwide awards. I know that South African talent, because of where I sit, is, is top-notch. Uh, but yet again, we're a net importer of maize. We're a net, sometimes a net importer of chicken. I don't get it, guys. I don't get what's going on in this country that from a farming perspective, we've lost the plot. What is happening to the farming industry of this country? When you get a country like New Zealand, you can export 80% of their cheese and their, and, and their sheep. Yet South Africa has to import chicken or import beef. It's ridiculous. And so there's a massive opportunity for us. I know that, remember I said to you about balance, balance your patience and your persistence. I'm mentoring a, a young uh, farmer by the name of Mpo. I won't tell you his surname because many of you might know him. And uh, he left corporate to become a beef and chicken farmer. He's loving it out in uh, Michalisburg and really doing a great job. But he said to me, Greg, this is a 10 to 20 year investment. He's a young man. He's 31 years old. Him and his wife and his two kids went there and uh, hopefully McDonald's can buy chicken and, and, and cage-free eggs uh, from him very, very soon. But he's made that commitment and he's got the right attitude as a farmer, 10 to 20 year commitment. The next thing that I think is going to come back uh, if it hasn't, if you haven't felt it already is home, family, culture, values, kids, mom, dad, grandparents. If you haven't felt it already, I just feel just so inspired. I've got my family living with me. We're all four big adults over here. The lady that works for me, she's brought her whole family over here. There's nine of us living in this family, and it's just so cozy, all right, for us to be. I've never had such strong relationships with my family before. And I think uh, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a good reflection on our values, on what's important in our lives. You know, is it important to drive that fancy car? live in that fancy house when we can lose our life at any point in time. The other trend that I've already alluded to is I think what's going to, what, what's going to happen in 10 years is going to happen in two years. So if we thought that we were going to have battery operated cars um, in the next 10 years, I think it's already on us. If we thought that many South Africans, I'll make this prediction. I don't think you'll, you'll believe me within the next five years. This is a little bit longer. Many South African people will drive around on little scooters and motorbikes and not take public transport. It's the way of young people becoming mobile and getting around. Big data is going to be important for those in the IT business. Consumer and business insights, incredibly important. We say in business, the balance between art and science is incredibly important. But in, 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 in a digital world, science is, is, is almost more important than art. And then I think the workplace of the future I think uh, the uh, restaurant of the future, if you walk into a McDonald's now, 
You can walk in, you can touch a digital kiosk, you can take a table number, we'll bring your food to you. It's completely changed the way we do things. And then the last thing is that your customer will continue to define who you are and how you play the game. Remember, in conclusion, or I want to tell you a story in conclusion. Remember that uh, you've got to follow customer trends and listen to what your customer says. But sometimes those mavericks out there on the this, on this Zoom call today have to create trends. So that's quite a fine journey, a fine line between creating gems and being a maverick and then following trends. Quick follower or the maverick. I'll leave you with a story. We had missed COVID, massive issues in our lives, big strategy thoughts. What are we going to do? All these big problems that sit on our lives. About seven years ago, my restaurant managers, I said to my restaurant managers, I said, this year, we're not going to get a bonus. This year, if you hit these three targets, we're going to get on a ship for seven days. We're going to sail to Mauritius and back, and we're going to spend seven days with each other. So they said, what are the targets? I said, we've got to hit this revenue target, this profit target, and of course, in McDonald's, because it's the most important thing, you've got to hit this people target. We didn't. Revenue and customer was the same issue. At that time, seven years ago, we had about 204 restaurants. 175 restaurant managers hit those three targets. Shows you it's not necessarily about a bonus, is it? Not necessarily about money. It's about an experience. It's about a challenge. It's about uh, something deeper. Anyway, we got onto this massive ship. It was as big as uh, two Ellis Park rugby stadium, soccer stadiums. It was like F&B Stadium on, on water. And off we went. We didn't have any cell phone signal. We didn't have any wireless network. I couldn't communicate with everyone. I was driving absolutely crazy. And one day I was, uh, I was standing at the back of the boat. Think of like you're standing at F&B Stadium. The stadium's moving at like knots, of, uh, knots and you're standing right at the end. And at the back, these massive jet engines are just chewing up the water and the boat is moving. And I asked myself, how does a boat turn? Where's the pilot? Who, who turns this boat? Does you just, you just turn it and it goes left and it goes right? It intrigued me for about seven days. As soon as I got halfway down, as soon as I got uh, onto land, I quickly got onto a computer and I Googled, how does a boat turn? And obviously, the, the answer maybe was obvious uh, in, in its concept, but not obvious in its engineering. So uh, a boat, uh, these days, a modern boat moves with jet engines. So it's got jet engines on the side and it propels it left and right. But uh, in the old days, the, bus, uh, the boat moves with a rudder. So with a big steering wheel, you turn the rudder left and the boat moves right. But because the boat is so big, it's so difficult to move the rudder, they had a small rudder inside the big rudder. When the small rudder turned left, the big rudder turned right. When the big rudder turned right, the boat turned left. It was the first primitive point of power steering. That little rudder is called the trim tab. T-R-I-M-T-A-B, the trim tab. And so the moral of the story as an engineer is power steering. But the moral of the story as a leader is that it's all about the little things that count in life, not about the big thing. The thank you, the hello, the greeting, the well done, the honesty and integrity, the hard messages that I have to deliver to my people every single day to save jobs, to cut salaries, to retrench people. It's not about the big things. It's about the little things and the way we do things in life. And I think if you can keep that in mind, I think the future's bright. I'll open it up to the Q&A. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Greg. Um, I will read the Q&A for, for you. It's quite robust. Uh, once again, what I'll do is I'll switch off my video so that I can get close to the screen to be able to read the Q&A. And we are still live on all the Empowerworks digital platforms, Facebook, Twitter, and I'll go to the Q&A now. There are some compliments. For example, Deboho remembers very well how drive through came through. It's still fresh in his mind. And he's thanking you for reminding me. Uh, Classy says, how would you explain transformation within the terrain of your executive and actually providing roles for young professionals to serve or perform executive functions? Well, we, we, uh, how would I describe it? I can just show you uh, the people in my business. 
So, uh, as I said to you, ninety-six uh, percent of McDonald's people are local South Africans. Uh, most of my people, north of eighty percent, are, are are below thirty-five years old. Sixty uh, percent of South, of McDonald's South African people are women. Uh, right from my executive team with Bridget de Gama and Joanne Devet, uh, heading up uh, those two chapters in human capital and franchising, uh, um, non-white ladies as well. Um, so my exco, except for myself, is, quite, is very transformed. You, you've got to walk the talk of transformation. It's not just about B scores. You've got to live it. And you've got to do it because it's the right thing to do. And uh, what's right to do in this country is to make sure that your business walks the talk. This McDonald's business, we always believe before BE points, before any form of transformation, is that if our customers were indicative of the South African population, our business needs to be indicative of the South African uh, population. I stand in front of you as, as, as probably the oldest person in the McDonald's system. I gave you an example of a, a 29-year-old uh, young, young man by the name of Gift who uh, is running a massive organization. Maybe, please God, one day he'll be the next Greg Solomon who leads this business. So don't do it for a score for a score sheet. Don't do it. Do it because it's the right thing to do. Make sure you understand that black people and women have been disadvantaged uh, in this country, and they need to, you know, be given a fair chance in this in, in this world. Stand up and, and 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 make sure that you that you brutally, like I'm saying to you, mention the, the brutal truth. And when you mention the brutal truth, work with the young men of this country to be able to say we welcome diversity in our organisation because that's the way it is. So if you can be indicative of the South African population, I don't really need to give you a plan. I can just show you my people and they can speak for themselves. Thank you very much, Greg. Um, then the next question is from Semi. Semi says, I want to know more about the McDonald's value chain. Who supplies the meat, rolls, veggies, fruit, drinks, ETC? Is it merely reinforcing pre-existing structural inequalities or advancing SMMEs? Mm. Well, I, I have to admit to you that uh, over the last 25 years, I'm probably not that proud of the last 20 years, but very proud of the last five years. Uh, look, we're a big business, so we consume the most beef um, probably than, than any other person. McDonald's and, and, the, and the fast food sector probably consumes 20% of all beef. So, very, very difficult to get an SME to be our beef processing plant, which is uh, Lipstar or Finlaw Foods. They really only got two main customers, McDonald's and Woolworths. Uh, but the type of work that we're doing with uh, young farmers like Impor to make sure that uh, that the uh, meat processing plant gets populated, uh, the Rametsis, our potato uh, farmers, uh, the, the Motles uh, that, uh, that, that, that do our chicken, it's, it's, it's very, very important. But once again, it's a long journey down the supply chain. But supply chain for us is not just about food. So to answer the question, you know, farming has typically been a very untransformed uh, farming place. I think we've seen a lot of traditionally white male farmers in the business. But, uh, but, but at the same time, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I haven't been satisfied with the conversion rate. It's not about necessarily us looking you know, for transformation in farming. I just don't think, if I may use this word, it's not a sexy profession. You know, it's not like IT or big data or Wi-Fi. You know, farming is tough. And I just think that the, the South Africa, I encourage the South African businessman and businesswoman to go out there. We should be a farming nation. But our supply chain is not just about farming. Our supply chain is about construction. We're quite transformed on the construction side. We've got a, a, a lot of transformed businesses. We've got a lot of lady-owned construction businesses as well that are helping us out. Um, our entire creative digital uh, above-the-line uh, company, uh, Pacinamix, uh, owned by Mr. Zungu, um, Manzini Zungu, is a total 100% black-owned business. Um, I mean, who would think McDonald's, one of the most, and you'll see one of our adverts that goes on, uh, goes on TV tomorrow, one of the biggest brands in the world, is, is held in the delicate hands of Manzini Zung uh, from Pacinamix. And uh, so he has a massive responsibility to keep those golden arches shining. So our supply chain is, is, is nice and transformed. I wouldn't say where I want it to be, uh, but we're on a journey and we're leading the way and um, very proud of the last five years. Uh, got lots more to do and lots more opportunities to give. 
<clears throat> Thank you very much, Greg. There are many questions, so we're going to need to... Okay, speed up my answers. ...pace ourselves. Uh, Trevor speaks about how do we get rural agri-support offtake uh, for our farmers. I think you have touched on that, and you can expand on it at a later point. Uh, this is another question from uh, Classy, and says, how much value up to this time did McDonald's lose as a result of COVID-19? And in your view, how long will it take to retain your business to operate and generate profit as well? Mm. Thanks, Classy. Look, it's devastating, guys. It sounds like I'm a confident CEO speaking to you about, you know, 10-year plans, but uh, it's absolutely devastating for us. We have pretty much wiped out 100% of our profit for the whole year. We'll have zero profit this year. I'm just figuring out how, how not to retrench people. At this present moment, we've kept all 16,000 people employed. We're asking the government, please, government, open up drive through I really don't understand why the government hasn't opened up drive through It makes no sense to me. They've given us delivery, all right, but they, basically we've taken 8 million customers a month and shoved us down delivery. I mean, I just don't get it. Uh, and in this forum, uh, forgive my passion around this particular point, but it's frustrating. I mean, I certainly don't want to send my 16,000 people all these young men and women to the front line to get infected. Why would I want to do that? But I know that if I don't do that, you know, we're going to be, we're going to be troubled in many other ways, troubled in unemployment, troubled in not earning money. So it's, you know, it's you, 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 you catch it, uh, you know, with a, with a hot water or you catch it with a hot iron. So it's, it's uh, at this present moment, um, you know, we've wiped out entire, our entire profit margin. We've, uh, I reckon that if we can come out with drive through, hopefully the, the presidency announces drive through in the next couple of days. If we can come out in a V shaped curve with a very positive type uh, attitude, I think we can recover. I'm predicting in the next 12 to 18 months, we can get back to 2019 quarter four volumes. If the market turns slower and the government flip flops us into, into, into level three, then into level two, then into level five and back and forth. And we, we can't get any stability. I'm afraid to say that, um, I think we're north of 24 months. You know, I said to my executive team, I know, Serge, you want me to be quick. I said to my executive team, there's two wars that we fought. The first is to stay at home. Now the big war is to put our people in the restaurants uh, and, uh, you know, hopefully they, they don't get infected. So to that question, somewhere between 12 and 24 months is pretty much where we're going to be. Okay, thank you. Le Mohang wants to know, how will you say are the elements for creating a functional system that ensures an amazing customer experience. Functional system. So people do things because they want to or because they have to. I don't mind which one it is, but at the end of the day, McDonald's knows exactly the process and the principles on, on how, to, how to do customer service. The question is, it's not about uh, Greg giving great customer service, Sichaba giving great customer service, and then, uh, you know, uh, John giving poor customer service. We're as weak as our weakest link. So we build our business around our people, our people culture, our people values. And what I'm trying to do every single day is to unlock the potential of every young man and woman uh, in the McDonald's organization so they can take responsibility for the customer, that they know that that customer is paying their wage and that customer is going to make sure that we grow from 300 to 400 restaurants. If we can get every single customer uh, interaction, it's not about price anymore even, whether you're buying it for 20 rand, 30 rand or 40 rand. It's about great hospitality. So we've changed our business completely. We've even got hospitality ambassadors. We call them gels, guest experience leaders in our lobby. And for us, it's all about the hospitality part of our business. And I think if you get that right, I think that adds the value. That puts the jacket on the suit. That puts the tie, you know, on the suit. And it just polishes it up. Customer service, customer interaction, transparency, uh, honesty, and integrity. That's, uh, that's what keep it, keeps it going. Okay. Uh, Tumisang has got quite a long uh, statement. I'll try to read it quite a lot. Some of it has to do with your presentation. Some of it is generic in terms of what it refers to. But let me go for it, for Tumisang. In this environment, as we have explained, things uh, are no longer going to be the same. Uh, you're going to do most of your businesses in deliveries. How do you make sure that delivery companies use correct disinfectants and they are going and they are doing the disinfecting? correctly as you are delivering food. Uh, the correct sanitizer for food, for example, is an opportunity for innovation for all COVID-19 products and the starting point 
in your company as a client and others. The imported products are priced high, people are retrenched, salaries are not guaranteed, so your prices are not going to be increased. What assistance uh, locally is your company giving in this regard? As I say, I'm sure you'll get a gist of what Ms. Sunny is saying. Yeah, I might not answer the question 100%, but I, I think with respect, I don't want to, I first, the first and most important thing, we're a food business. We've been sanitizing our hands for the last 25 years. We've been wearing gloves for the last 25 years. We've been wearing hair nets for the last 25 years. So for a person in the banking industry, this is strange. But for the people working at this level of standard in McDonald's, my people are like I was in Woodmeat McDonald's today. You know, I was with uh, Lucky, the restaurant manager there. It was like normal. The only thing he couldn't see was my face. I had to smile with my eyes, not with my face, because I'm sitting talking like this to everybody. That's the, that was my worst thing to do. So I think, you know, the McDonald's supply chain has already got all the sanitizer, all, this, all, all the disinfectant. If we get an infection in the restaurant, we can close it down. We can clean it within 20 hours. So, so I think we are a little bit privileged there. Um, we have these very, very high standards uh, for us in our business. But I will say to, to you this, that gives you that commitment. This COVID's going to pass. This COVID's going to pass. Be careful you don't jump on the gravy chain. This is not about selling PPE, all right? This is about thinking about what's next in the next 24 months. So I know I didn't answer the question directly, all right? What we're making sure is we're making sure that our employees are safe, that they've got hand masks, they get sanitizing, that their families are safe, that their transportation mode is safe. Because if they're safe, they're happy. If they're happy, they can give you hospitality as a customer. You'll come back again. Okay. I'll read a quick comment, and then we're going to speed it really fast here. Uh, okay. Mozuko is really loving uh, your passion and what you do, and would like to be mentored by you. So just a comment there. Glenda is saying, Greg, does McDonald's purchase from SMEs, or do you only support big businesses? We only support big businesses. No, I'm joking. I'm joking. I'm joking, guys. No, look, uh, clearly, uh, clearly we want to change it around a little bit, you know. So, uh, we, we, I mean, look at our plumbers and our electricians. And, you know, where, where I have a problem with the small business guys is I say, look, we want to, we want to handle your beef. Uh, we want to be the beef supplier. And, uh, well, what have you got? Who have you got? No, it's me and my brother. We've got a partner. So, and then I'm very tough on those SMEs. I'm saying, guys, become a beef farmer first. Go and invest 10 million rand on some cows and supply my beef plant. You know, I mean, that's, that's the level. We're talking about a big business over here. But, it, but, but we've had small business people. I mean, the guy that makes ice cream cones for us started off as a small entrepreneur making ice cream cones. And he's now a mega business sell, selling ice cream cones to McDonald's and probably KFC and Burger King. So you can start off small, you know, in an organization and, and get very large. So you start off as an SME. You be patient. You give good service. You build loyalty and build trust in an organization. And there's no doubt, just like Manzini Zungu, who started off as a one-man show, all right? Will ultimately get to a large organization with mega clients. It's a stepping mm -hmm. stone. We're going to speed it up. Somebody's wondering why you took filo fish off the menu, which was fantastic. I'm sure the marketing guys can also address that particular one. Um, there's a question here around how do you plow back to the community? And yeah, just a quick one there. Very, very quick. We've got a charity called Ronald McDonald House of Charities. We haven't marketed it because we, uh, we don't feel we do charities for marketing. We do it for impact. It's at the Nelson Mandela Children's Hospital. Um, basically, it's a little hotel for, for moms to be close to their kids that are very, very sick. We see 7,000 moms every single month. Uh, we know that we can't bring medical care to kids that are in very, very fatal, uh, fatal issues. But what we know is we can bring families together. So if a mom lives in Polokwane, and uh, she needs to be close to her kids. She can stay in our little facility. And we know that we can't give medical care, but we can give hope, we can give love, and we can give family togetherness. So that's okay. our big program. We've got many other small programs. I think let me read Harvey's email again, because now I'm reading it carefully. It says, good evening. Why removing the healthy filet of fish from your menu? I know I said marketing guys mm. will come it, but let me just make sure that I respect the question and yeah. ask it to you. Well, you know, Harvey, uh, who says that the Mac Royale is not more healthy than the Fisher Filet? So, you know, we have this perception as customers is what, uh, is what is healthy and what is not. And I'm happy you asked the, the health question. So our biggest opportunity in McDonald's is to teach you what's in McDonald's food, not to have a perception that fish is more healthy than meat. 
because if fish was deep fried and the meat was grilled, why, Harvey, are you thinking fish was more healthy than the Mac Royale, for example, which is a very, or well, the chicken fold over or the, uh, so we got a big job to do. It's not your fault, Harvey. It's my fault uh, as the leader of McDonald's. How do we tell our South African consumers what's in a Mac Royale? It's 100% beef, salt and pepper. It's lettuce, it's tomatoes, it's onion. All right. Can't go better than that. Thank you. Jimmy is asking, does McDonald's have policies regarding guarding the future of work of its employees with uh, implementation of automated, automated systems taking over? Yeah, so I'm a, I'm a very, very vocal on this particular point. I know I haven't got time to answer this question. I, I, don't, I don't think robots are going to take over humans. I think they're going to create new opportunities for humans. So we put self-ordering kiosks in our, in our restaurants to take care of the mundane thing so we can put guest experience leaders into the lobby to take care of our customers. So for me, uh, I think it's, it's, it's going to change through innovation. And I think as big business, especially in South Africa, where we cannot eradicate jobs, we need, we need to use computers and robots to create innovation and new, and, and new sectors. Okay, thank you. There's a baby boomer. Glenda says, Greg, I'm a baby boomer. And I've always mm. thought that McDonald's is a place for kids. You have changed my mind this evening. Um, well, one, uh, wonderful. Yeah, I'll skip okay. there. Okay, uh, I'll the quickly say one. Okay, the question from Nonsanza is, do you employ differently abled people? Yes, we have a, a, a large portfolio of uh, disabled people. I think the number is just short of uh, 250, I think it is. It's, uh, it's not big enough in a labor force of 16,000 people. Our biggest issue is we're working with hot, hot cooking materials and hot, uh, and hot surfaces and things like that. Uh, but, yeah, but I want to try to get that number larger if we can. But we've got quite a lot of people that are, that are disabled. Okay. You do get quite a lot of compliments in terms of how you have delivered the staff. Let me go to Tuli. Thank you, Mr. Craig. As a current person, as a current chairperson of the franchise forum is South Africa, I would like to know how does the McDonald's franchise include young people in the franchise space as owners or suppliers? Because your mm -hmm. company orders 50% of their products from China. That's Tuli. Mm. Actually, Tuli, we, uh, we actually are almost 90% South African products. We only import 10% of our products, so I must correct you on that one. Look, the franchise one is going to be a difficult question, and I hope uh, I, I, it does, I don't throw out a, a lot of disrespect uh, in, in, this, in this business. One of, one of the most expensive franchisees uh, in the country is a McDonald's franchise because we expect so much from our franchisees. Um, if I had to show you... Uh, Peter Moyanga, uh, our largest franchisee, he would probably speak as eloquent uh, and probably more intelligent than me. Portia Nondo, Victoria Moyo, Spiwes Kosana, these are very, very strong, uh, powerful franchisees uh, in our organization of mega businessmen and women. Um, and, uh, you know, obviously it takes a while for us to get them, but you also need to look at their journey. They didn't all start as McDonald's franchisees. They started off as a small franchisee with a much smaller fee. They cut their teeth on, on that, and that's where you start. And I think that's what I say to the young guys. I know that I'm, I'm not giving you the message that you want, and I know that as young people, you want that opportunity. Your opportunity is probably better to come work for McDonald's and work your way up because this is the university of life. This is not instant gratification. And to become a Peter more younger, you're probably going to have to become a franchisee of a small Shishinyama or something like that build up some equity in order for you to be able to, it's not just about money. It's about the type of businessman Peter Moyanga is or Portia Nanda is uh, as those two individuals. No insult to the youngsters, but very difficult to become a McDonald's franchisee. Not impossible, um, but, uh, but build, build your portfolio. Build your portfolio of strength. Start somewhere. Oh, thank you very much, Greg. There. Let me just acknowledge uh, comments that have come from our social media uh, platforms from uh, Malisela, who basically says, uh, hi, Greg, why hi. are you focusing on specific enterprise and put all eggs in one basket or not? Diversity says, do you want to diversify or put um, all eggs in one basket because you said focus on maybe one or two things? And then Malisela pretty much has that. Let me just go to one from Bupiro. Great insights, Craig. How is McDonald's planning to go green? And lastly, um, 
I guess the question from Asilina is, what does it take to a ticket CEO in the restaurant uh, franchisee? So I acknowledge Masilela, even though some of the questions I couldn't quite get uh, properly. I didn't get the second question. What does it take to be a CEO? Is that what, he, is that, is that what the question is? Yeah, to be a ticket CEO in the restaurant. Oh, tick, ticking CEO. Well, I, I mean, a lot of, lot of CEOs will, will disagree with me. As I said, it's taken me 25 years to get here. I've been a chief, uh, chief operations guy for five years and then CEO for many years. I can cook you a Big Mac. I can cook you a French fries. I can write you a strategy. And I believe a CEO um, in an operations consumer-facing business needs to be able to do what uh, he expects his people to do. But at the same time, uh, I employ people that are cleverer than me, that are better than me. And there's no doubt I don't have to look outside of McDonald's to find my replacement. I will find the next Greg Solomon inside the talent of this wonderful organization. Uh, on the green side, uh, we, uh, we are really, we're really there. I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't present with you if I thought, you know, we weren't there already. The, a lot of work we're doing on our waste, making sure that our waste is, is going the green, not there 100%. A lot of work around water. We know that we could probably save about 10,000 swimming pools of water by doing one or two things. A um, lot of work around geysers and hot water, a um, lot of work around recycling our shortening to make sure it's biodiesel and I can go on and on. But, uh, you know, every single company needs to look at it. I'm struggling a bit with solar just because our roof is small compared to the amount of power that we need. Cool. Uh, I think we have a few minutes to, to round up, but just the general sentiment has been uh, around. Thank you very much for the insights and everything that you basically do. There are a lot of questions around wanting to be part of the supply chain. Uh, is information available on your website where people can go, or how do people uh, follow up on to get more information? Uh, I'll probably, uh, if it's okay with you, Sichaba, I'll probably, uh, just because of this audience is so you know unique and elite, I'll try to get you a link uh, to my supply chain team, probably Slendile or Susan, um, and uh, then you can get a, a direct access to, to them. But please bear in mind, uh, ladies and gentlemen, not going to be easy to get in there. You're going to need uh, some real robust business plans, some good thinking. Uh, this, is, this is a big supply chain, and, and that supply chain team means business. Now, this is personal. The foundation of McDonald's is QSC and V. Post-COVID and everything else, do you think that's still going to be the same or are you going to have to bring something else as your closing remarks? 63 years ago, Ray Kroc founded this business on a principle called QSC and V, quality, service, cleanliness, and value. Five years ago, we rewrote our strategy and the center was QSC and V, quality, service, cleanliness, and value. Post-COVID 2020, 2021, our focus will be QSC and V, quality, service, cleanliness, and value. Why is it so important to keep it so tight? You know, at the end of the day, you need to go back to the foundations that have grown your business. You can change the stuff around it. Um, you can change what it looks like, low GI buns, delivery, the evolution of McDonald's. Everything changes around. But culture and values and the core principles of the founder of the business is, is the recipe for the perfect uh, McDonald's story. And so just remember, you know, we can be different in our values, in our cultures, in our background, but we, we must unite on our culture. Strategy is certainly who we are as leaders, but culture, culture is the way we do things around here. Is there any question that you'd have liked the entrepreneurs to ask you Ask yourself and answer it in less than 15 seconds. No, I think they've been absolutely fantastic. Uh, once again, they've confirmed my confidence in this country, my confidence in the youth, my confidence in the talent as business leaders. Uh, God bless you guys. I wish you well. Stay safe. Be patient. Be persistent. But be focused. Thank you very much, Mr. Craig Solomon, CEO of McDonald's of Africa, for taking time to give us some reflections on what you go through during this lockdown period and what you are planning for as we begin to open up the economy. As I said at the beginning of this uh, conversation, I said to get a direct invite to the Thursday, 21st of May, 2020, talk by Mr. Tokozani Nkosi, CEO, 
and co-founder of Newsroom Africa, visit our WhatsApp number 082-088-5262 or visit the Empowerworks uh, website. A big thank you for everyone who joined us live on the digital platforms. And this has been an Empower Entrepreneurs Digital Conversation, a COVID-19 discussion hosted by Empowerworks. A big thank you once again to Mr. Craig Solomon for sharing insights. Thank you, everyone. Have a good night.